All right, what is an 0341? What is a Mortarman? Well, today we're going to find out. Today we've got... Corporal Lupovitz. Corporal Lupovitz. Yep. I appreciate you coming out to uh, take some time to chat with me and, and uh, be able to kind of explain a little bit about what it is that an 0341 does and what it means to be a mortarman because a lot of people don't realize like they don't know they don't know anything about mortarman they just like maybe hear about it in movies or they maybe they play call of duty or something and they yeah. think that that's kind of what it is but it's a lot more complicated than that obviously so um yeah i appreciate your time coming out here to do this uh where are you from originally i'm from palm springs california Palm Springs, near 29 Palms? Like 45 minutes away. Were your parents in the Marine Corps? No, my dad came from Israel, so he was in Israeli Special Forces. No kidding. Uh, he moved down here when he was about 21. Did he ever teach you, like, Krav Maga or anything? No. No? <laughs> I would. But that's cool, though. So he's, is he, he was from, did he live in, like, Tel Aviv or something over yeah. there? Born in Tel Aviv. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so you, but you were born here. I was born here. In Palm Springs. Mm -mm. Okay. And when did you join the Marine Corps? I joined the Marine Corps June of 2021. June of 2021? Yep. You try to see if we can bring, scoot that little microphone. You just like angle. There you oh, go. There just you go. a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, so June of 2021, you said? Yep. Okay. Um. Let's see. When, so June, June, July, August. So you went to... Infantry training battalion in September, October, it, or well, October time frame? Uh, it took a while for us to pick up in the actual ITB company. Okay. So I was in Mac Company, or Lima, on the West Coast, and then I went to home for a little bit before I ended up picking up with the actual training battalion. Okay. So I, I got into ITB around, like, October time frame. October? Yeah. Okay. All right, that makes sense. Uh. Now, West Coast Infantry Training Battalion is significantly different than East Coast Training Battalion. From what I've heard, yes. Yeah, because you guys got the alpha shelf yep. and a lot of steep terrain that we don't have here in Camp Lejeune or Camp Geiger mm. and things like that. So what what was it like going through Infantry Training Battalion out there on the West Coast? Um, surprisingly cold for California because the, the time frame I went, like, Especially being so highly elevated, yeah. I'm like in like the alpha shelf and stuff. Like we would get frosted and stuff. Yeah, it's a and it's a different kind of weather than this. And then also, just like it depletes all the water from your body when you go on like hikes and stuff like that. It's it's different than this kind of heat where it's like you you you'll cramp up, but if you hydrate enough, you're good. There was no amount of hydrating that could save you from those cramps. Really. Yeah. Because is is it just it's just dry heat, right? Mm. Yeah. Even in the winter time, it's still pretty dry. Yeah. Yeah. What what kind of temperatures are we talking? When it was dropping down there. So, it would only get to like fifty five, sixty, which seems like nothing here. Yeah. But like there, it was surprisingly cold. Really. Yeah. I know Twenty Nine Palms gets real cold in the winter time. I've been there a couple times for that, and that was pretty gnarly. And you're always like praying for the sun to come up so you can get that warm sun on your face. That's what I like about. Cali more than over here because like here it'll be cold from like the morning and it'll transition throughout the whole day and still be cold yeah like in Cali the sun comes up you're warm again you're warm again mm -hmm. it's like a saving grace yep yeah no I like that that is one thing I do like the, the California weather I will say is pretty forgiving and it is very nice especially in Southern California where like Pendleton and all that stuff is um you know, it's usually always sunny. It doesn't rain nearly as much. The humidity's not nearly as bad, so you're not, like, walking out of your front door and getting covered in a layer of moisture like you do here. No. Um, but tell me about the uh, tell me about the mountains. What are the mountains up there like for ITB? Uh, yeah, there, you know, there's different paths on the mountains that, like, some would range from, like, you could – reach out and touch your hand on the ground and then some were not too bad yeah and it's just something you get adapted to yeah and then you know you just move with it it's it's different from here because like people say one one way is different like like hiking here is worse hiking there is worse it, it's just different because we do a lot of hard walk like 
hard road, just hikes, which messes up your feet. Yeah. But then there, we were on like soft gravel, and then you're hiking up a mountain, which is also difficult. It is. Just, yeah, especially when you're yeah. yeah, well, yeah, you got to pick pick your poison, I guess. Pick your yeah. Poison, yep. Yeah. But as far as like the grade up there, like you're going up pretty steep grade, you're carrying like your crew serve weapons and stuff like that. Mm. Um, people don't. There, there's definitely there's definitely a big difference between going up some steep grades with crew serve weapons than there is when you're flat terrain for sure. Because right. uh, I mean we we don't have nearly as many inclines in Hawaii, which is where I was, mm -hmm. than you do in Pendleton. Pendleton's got a lot more, yeah. uh, a lot more mountains for sure. But I do remember having these steep incline hikes or periods of time where you're going up like steep hills, mm -hmm. and it is a mental test it's like a mental resilience test oh, yeah because like physically you could probably do it right yeah. no no problem you're physically in good enough shape where you could handle it but like you want to quit the whole time you're going because it's just like you know it's just miserable it's not an it's not like a pleasurable experience yeah. you're just like i gotta just hang on for dear life and and mm -hmm. get the way get all the way through this thing you know uh, that's what mostly like this job is like physically like most of the time you'll get through it but mentally there's always something in the back of your head telling you you want to quit yeah you just got to fight through it and keep yeah. pushing yeah that's for sure so anyway what you went to itb what kind of you you went to learn you became a mortarman no 341 right. what kind of uh weapon systems were you guys working with as mortarman in the uh pipeline is it still four weeks it was four weeks in the beginning of 03xx and then four weeks of mortars yep and what what kind of weapon system do you guys focus on so we're just strictly 60 millimeter mortars 81 millimeter mortars and uh a lot of a lot of just gun drills yeah all day every day aiming stakes and all that mm -hmm. so we got the stakes that we lay out on our direction of fire and then that's where we do the gun drills off of yeah and yeah, I know like nowadays they be teaching them like about FTC and like aiming circles, which is like crazy because like that's like next level. Yeah, but they're yeah. teaching that to the the basic students now. Now they are apparently Gee. not like in depth, but like just so they're familiarized on it. Okay, familiarization that yeah. makes sense. Now, you guys didn't do one twenties. No, no, t no, nothing around with that. No, so like. Really, no one in the Marine Corps, but like, you know, Marsoc and like Artie and stuff. Like, but no one touches 120s. Really, I I touched it a couple times, and they're super fun to use. Super heavy. Yeah, but yeah, probably loud as crap. Yeah, I know 81s are really loud. People don't understand. Like, they hear these videos, and it's like. The do sound, jump. yeah, the the sound kind of like is muffled a little mm -hmm. bit when it when like a round goes off. I've I've, I've seen some videos where like you sometimes won't even hear because it like it, it'll, the frequency won't even pick up on the phone and like it just doesn't register. Yeah. yeah, but then you get in front of it and it's like you're gonna blow your eardrums out if you don't have good ear pro in. Yeah, yeah, it's bananas. So you you shot sixty millimeter mortars and eighty one millimeter mortars, and that's kind of what you guys learned while you're there. You uh you probably had to learn all about like the nomenclature of everything like that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like so, there's, there's not really dis dis and ass like dis disassembly assembly, right? No, not not really. I mean, with eighty ones, you know, you get a misfire, you take out like the firing pin, but that's about as much dis and ass that you, know, you do. Yeah, yeah. And the firing pin is located where? It's at the bottom of the tube. Okay. So it's uh. You know, you drop the round into the tube, it hits the primer, it goes out. The firing pin uh, basically is the thing that's stri uh, stri striking the primer and yeah. allowing the round to go out. And that firing pin that strikes the primer, that's in the bottom of the actual cannon, mm -hmm. and it's, like, stationary and not, doesn't move. For 81s, it doesn't move. Uh, for 60s, there's, like, a fire selector switch so you could do drop fire which you just drop the round in the tube and it fires you could do a uh, trigger fire where you have to manually trigger it and then there's a safety as well i've seen those yeah you can like it's almost like handheld yeah so right? you could do handheld or conventional or combination of both 
what's the diff what is handheld with so you can only do handheld with 60s right correct yeah what is handheld with 60s so you just have a uh, smaller base plate and then basically you know the the gunner's holding it and he's eyes on the target his a gunner will be tapping the range scale that's on it and uh once you get your approximate range and uh you're on the target He'll tell you that well, you're good, and then you fire that. Yeah. And I've heard of guys taking, like, the base plate and setting it against, like, a Humvee tire if they wanted to do some, like, direct fire stuff. Is that even a thing? I don't really know. Uh, I mean, I definitely wouldn't do it. No. Like it may, No, it I wouldn't be, either. Maybe plausible, but... Uh, you, heard, you ever heard stories like that? I've heard, like, there's been stories of them shooting it off, off of buildings. Yeah. Shooting them at buildings, like, directly. I, a, a little lot, sketchy. A lot of those older rounds also, like, the way the rounds were made, it allows it to do direct fire because they're, like, they're not as stable. Okay. The rounds nowadays, it has to hit a certain velocity when it's coming down, and then that's what allows the round to go off. So they're just more, they're more stable mm. nowadays just from a manufacturing po- standpoint? Yeah, so we don't accidentally... Uh, kill ourselves by dropping around yeah what you've seen yeah you've seen like the news articles like the one specifically the one that comes to mind is the one that happened in california where like you had like a whole gun line lose their life because of a misfire that happened and something like that yeah no that makes sense so you get through itb right you learn about probably you probably spend a lot of time on misfire procedures and firing procedures probably spend a lot of time on like how to was it what's it called um elevation mm-hmm. and deflection deflection yep. what is elevation and deflection for people that don't know so deflection is basically we'll have like a mill scale on our site and uh so it's adjusted in mills mm-hmm. and how many there's 6400 mills in a circle right correct okay uh so basically you'll get a deflection you'll spin it on the site and that moves your site laterally and then you gotta adjust the gun put it on there and then elevation obviously up and down yeah and then that's how we get up on our target yeah and you guys have like you have to do like math or like the plotting boards you guys have are kind of doing the math for you yeah so uh so i'm in i'm the fdc chief and my job is basically to get information from our fo's up on the hill uh, we'll get grids, plot our gun, plot our target on the boards, and also we have a computer system that uh, we could check with as well called the LHMVC. And uh, what does the computer system do? So we just input our data, like our gun pause and like direction of fire and stuff like that. Yeah. And then like the target, and then it will automatically come up with. It'll spit out your deflection and elevation. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. I don't know if we had that. I'm not sure if we had that or not. Do you guys still use those, like, plotting boards and stuff, too? Yeah. You use both? We use both just in case, like, manual error, like, you know, sometimes the LHMBCs act up because they're they're pretty old now, so. Oh, okay. Maybe they they did have them. I'm not a mortarman. I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe they've had them around for a little bit, but that makes sense. Okay, so you have some, like, um... What's the word for it? Like some uh, redundancy mm-hmm. in case one is messed up, you can still yeah. do it the other way. Yeah. Kind of like having GPS, but also knowing how to land nav with the compass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, we always use at least like two forms of checking. So okay. I run my FTC squad and I have a primary plotter. He's the one on the computer uh, doing all the data there. And then yeah. I have two check plotters who are both on boards. And... Uh, Depending on the mission, I'll either take a board if my guys are being a little slow or I'll <laughs> have another spare computer just in case yeah. that I could get on. Okay. And uh, So you can check just to make sure everything is, like, in order the way it's supposed to be? Yeah, just in case, like, you know, one of the LHMBCs goes down or, like, my guys are messing up and I got to, you know, step in. Yeah. But I think at the point I am now, my squad's pretty good, so... 
I I don't have a lot to worry about with them. Yeah. Luckily. So right now, what's your current belt? You said you're the FDC chief. What does yep. FDC stand for for people that don't know? It stands for Fire Direction Center. Fire Direction Center. Now, is the Fire Direction Center responsible for all the fires for the entire battalion or just for 81s? Just for 81s. Okay. So, like, already will have their own FDC internally. Okay. Whereas we do as well. All right. So, you guys, you're basically, like, the guy that's in charge of fires for Weapons Company. Yep. Right? And Weapons Company is essentially, like, usually in charge of fires for the whole battalion to a certain degree, right? At yeah. the end of the day, like, the, the Weapons Company commander is typically like the fires guy mm -hmm. right yeah so so you work with your company commander a lot i imagine uh not as much because no they don't really come down to watch us as much as like our fo is on the hill okay because you know obviously they all want to see impacts they all want to see you know how the fo's are passing data yeah we're giving them like readback stuff like that Sure. So they like having that overview perspective. They'll come down eventually, like sometimes, but yeah, you know, their focus is more of like, all right, you could do your job. Now let's see like the impacts. Yeah, let's yeah. see if you're actually doing it in a timely matter. Right. You know, that makes sense. Well, so being the FDC chief, what is your squad size or what, what is your, like your unit size? Who are you responsible for exactly? So. I'm in charge of my FDC, which consists of the private plotter and two check plotters. And then I also have an RO with me. Okay. And for accountability purposes, I have two docs okay. in my squad as well. Cool. So you're not actually on the gun line anymore. You're working just like in the, like at the fire center, right? Yeah. And the gun line is out there actually dropping the rounds and, and laying the sandbags down and figure and like doing the adjustments on the guns and everything like that. Yep. Okay. Now, did you ever do that? I imagine yeah. you spent some time doing that for Yeah, when before. I first got to the fleet. Um, How long did you do that for? Maybe like four or five months-ish. Okay. Before I went to the FTC. Okay. You went to the FTC about four or five months in? Mm -hmm. Did you go to your advanced school after you got to FTC? No, I was already in FTC one. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you went to you went to FTC. Do you think that helped you pass some of the stuff at advanced school? So, um, our advanced school is very FDC prioritized. It's very heavy on it? Yeah, because I would like to say that FDC is the hardest part about being a mortarman. Okay. Um, but Which I would maybe be a biased perspective. Well, I'm inclined to believe you because you're, <laughs> ma you're the mortarman. I got some other buddies that, that are mortarman too that... I was friends with, I've been friends with that said the same thing. Yeah. They said FDC is just, is just one of the hardest things to do because you're the one that's coordinating everything. Yeah. You know? So, um, it definitely, for some, it, cause our A school is different than how we run in the fleet. So sometimes they go into it with bad habits. Oh, okay. But most of the time, like having that little bit of understanding or shouldn't be a little bit, it should be a, a really good understanding right. of how to do it. It yeah. definitely helps you. Yeah. What What do you What's the What makes FDC so difficult in your opinion? Um. So. I think the main thing is like, it, it's hard to. Uh, you You got to know so much about what's going on, like, like battle space wise. Yeah. So, with the gun line, you worry about your gun. Okay. The FTC, we got to worry about everyone's gun. And I don't know why, but for some reason, it's harder for people to plot on a board and pull their deflection in range than to spin to the spin the sights on the sight and uh, get the gun up. Yeah. But, I mean, more demands to know how to do every part of their job at the end of the day. And, yeah. Uh, do you guys do a lot of cross-training then? Yeah, so, I mean, we're not we're always attached like we're not like fo's like our fo's are pushed out to the line companies and now attached to them yeah the fdc is always going to be with the gun line like, okay we're all in weapons company we all work together yeah now a lot of the time i'll take my individual squad and do some more fdc training because it's it needs to be more harped on okay and other 
parts of the job. So I'll do a lot of individual training with them, but we work with the gun line a lot. And, yeah. Uh, coordinating how we're going to do stuff. So we all are in the same mind space when we're going into it. Yeah. Now, what what's a day to day like for you guys being in in a eighty one millimeter mortar platoon? I know it's going to be a little bit different than the sixties, obviously, because being in a line company is different than being in the weapons company. But for you guys, like, what kind of things do you guys do on a day to day for sustainment and training, and just like what what's your day to day life as as a mortarman like? So, we normally do PT at like five thirty every morning, um, either section or squad. Get done with that. Then we'll pull from the army and do a lot of gun drills, FDC, board drills, a bunch of bunch of stuff like that. We try to mix it up doing like we'll like sometimes we'll do gun drills, sometimes we'll do like mounting, like mount drills, um getting people familiar with like how to use a compass. Okay. You know. There there's a lot of like individual tasks that you could do to get everyone proficient at yeah the job so you guys you guys do a lot of sustainment stuff with your weapon systems and also cross training people from to learn how to do fdc if they're on the gun line most of the time or if they're in fdc maybe you let them do a little gun line training yeah let them go back and forth so right now we're actually running a primer so we could send people to uh advanced school okay so for that, I'm I'm basically the lead instructor on my section's uh, primer, and I'm just going through like basic missions with them, and then at the end of the week, we're gonna have them test out and see who's the most capable and going to school in the next uh, class. Nice, and that's to go to the advanced school. Yep. What was advanced school like for you? Um, I honestly had a blast. Like, yeah. Uh, is it kind of similar to the way that the other guys said their advanced schools were as far as, like, you're doing a lot of dismounted stuff? Oh, yeah. We, we're only dismounted, which is, like, crazy to think we're, because in the flea, like, we do a lot of, like, hip shoots and stuff like that, like, mounted stuff. Yeah. But in school, it's a lot of RSOP, which is just uh, recon selection, occupation, modifier position. So we're going out there. Basically, just finding our position. Like we did in the, we're doing a lot of stuff like in the tree lines and stuff. So it was hard to set up, and it made everyone think a little more. Yeah. And then RA school is also like, whereas like the other MOSs, their main like failing factor is like field stuff or like orders or stuff like that. Like for us, it was if you could pass fdc you could pass the course okay yeah that's what everybody always said was the hardest part about the course is the fdc piece yeah yeah and it's because of just like the complexity of like how how you're actually achieving that Mm -hmm. while you're there we just have there's just so many different missions which people don't really understand and it makes like like outsiders looking in they don't understand how to utilize mortars yeah because what types of missions are we talking about like so like about like grid polars that talking about like that type of stuff yeah and then like also advanced missions so like searches and traverses range lat spreads sea ads like there's a oh of, okay yeah suppression of enemy air defense right yep. yeah yeah so you guys almost kind of do missions that people talk about in like the jtac primer almost some yep. of that stuff mm-hmm. okay that's the first time I'd ever heard of C ads was the JTAC primer. Uh, but I know that I know that mortarmen have a lot of different things that specifically 81s. Like you guys do trap missions too, right? Um normally it's uh so we have two sections. Okay. So we right now are not really doing any of that, but Sometimes the section will go and be a trap team or okay. stuff like that. But yeah, which is tactical recovery of air personnel, right? Mm-hmm. Is that what it means? Is it air personnel? I'm not. I'm not sure. I think it's tactical recovery of air personnel. I want to say yeah. I might be wrong, but um, yeah. So, so FTC is the hardest piece. You what? 
what are what what makes these other missions com- like complex? Is it because of the way that they want the sheaf to be landing for the missions, or like how is like what is that? So, f- yeah, the sheaf like they could open up the sheaf, which you know that means the guns would have to fire different data. Yeah, they could close it. They could do a lot of different stuff with it, and then also like like certain missions you gotta you'll have multiple target plots because if we're shooting at something that spans like 300 meters like why oh we gotta figure out like we're either we gotta go to the midpoint and then have a starting area like figure out our own starting area or they'll give us two endpoints and then we gotta work with that area so there's a lot more like like it's not just shooting one target yeah it's like you'll have multiple targets with a set area and you need to figure out which direction the fires need to be going in order to hit those targets and you do you have to like is it with the intent of hitting multiple targets in or like from one mission mm-hmm. or like multiple targets multiple different missions so or a mixture of yeah so i mean mixture of both like like for uh, searches and traverses like that is one mission where i'll give them like the starting grid or the starting deflection elevation and then I'll give them like how many rounds they're going to be using like if they're traversing in which way or if they're searching in which way and they'll basically shoot a couple rounds spin their traverse handle shoot a couple more spin it until they've for a set number of increments right yep. like a set number of mills mm-hmm. yeah not increments mills probably that that's the more accurate term but yeah so they're like they might have, you might be like, hey, so traversing, for example, here's a target right here, and here's a target right here. You're gonna shoot so however many you're gonna shoot this many rounds at this at these mills, and then you'll traverse, and then you'll shoot this many rounds at these mills. You'll traverse, and then basically it's like you're dropping in like this sh- linear sheaf almost, but they're like having to shoot multiple locations throughout that whole thing. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's complicated. Mm-hmm. Especially if like you're having to do that, do those adjustments on the fly. Like, yeah. do they always have like those coordinates already preset, or like are they getting fed that stuff as they're hitting targets, or like how's that? Work? Oh, so so basically, like the FO will come over the radio and he'll give us the target and he'll say whether it's like you know the length and width of the target and whether we have to traverse or search in which way. Okay, so. The FDC will have all the presets. It, like, it's not very important for the gun to know exactly what the battle space looks like. Okay. But the FDC get... needs to know. Yes. Okay. So, like, we'll get the target, like, description and stuff like that. Because a lot of the times, if you're good with your FOs, your FOs will trust you and be able to be like, all right, we don't need to request stuff because we know that you will do the right thing. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And that... So that pretty much sums up what advanced school is mostly. You're just practicing your craft. You're learning how to do FDC at like a very proficient level. You're you're still doing like field leadership evaluations and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Like at a squad level, like you'll be acting as a squad leader. Mm-hmm. Do you still do stuff like that's like dismounted stuff that may not necessarily have anything to do with mortars there? Like those leaders, those uh, field leadership evaluations? Uh, not really. It's very heavily mortar. It's very centered on mor- mortars and support of like maneuver and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we, yeah. So there's, we had one maneuver ranch and, uh, yeah. Uh, it's just uh, a little weird doing it in school, but yeah. definitely, like, it's definitely, you got to be able to. That's normal. Know where you are and the maneuver is. And yeah. Have you done range 400 before? Uh, or like the the mechanized assault course or the battalion assault course or anything like yeah. that out in the ITX. Uh, oh, not no no no. I I haven't gone to ITX. They haven't been to an ITX yet. I wish. Where are you guys going? Do you know? I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe that's not like a thing where everyone has to do that every year. No, it's not now. It's like you you know you may be slotted to go. You may not. Oh, okay, makes sense. Yeah, it used to be a thing where it's like every single unit went every single year if they were deploying. Like there was like a requirement at one point, at least for, from what I understand. Um, but 
nonetheless, you still get plenty of time to drop rounds in the field and coordinate from the FTC in the field. Like you guys drop rounds here, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, did you drop any rounds in Virginia, West Virginia, where you guys were? No, uh, through the. I don't think I. Oh yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. Did a little bit. Yeah. Okay. But you do definitely hear because there's tons of ranges on Camp Lejeune where you can drop rounds. I mean, they have tons of like yeah areas sectioned off for that kind of stuff, like oh, yeah. impact areas for it. Mm-hmm. Um, what's day to day life for you guys like here outside of just doing your cross training and prepping guys for uh, advanced school? Like, what do you do? I mean, I know that you guys um, you go to the armory, you pull your weapons, you practice gun drills, you practice like. Do you use aiming stakes every day? Yeah, so our stakes, we always pull them. Okay. Because we always need that, you know, that object that the site could get up on. Okay. Now, there's a, there's a way to do it off of, like, the side of a building and stuff like that, but... Or a yeah. tree. Or a tree. Can you use yeah. a tree? Yep. Okay. You can use any straight edge. Any straight edge object so you can use it as, like, a... What do you yeah, use it like as? a reference point? Like as a reference, okay, for your like direction of fire, okay, and stuff like that. All right, and do you guys like ride out into the training areas and stay out? Do you go to the field pretty frequently here? Or? Oh yeah, like how often do you think? Um, it, it just depends on like the month. Like sometimes we'll be out there three weeks out of the month, and then sometimes like we may go one. Like okay. it's not very consistent. Our time in the field and our time in garrison. Okay. It just varies based on, like, when they were able to lock ranges down probably. Yeah, because there's a lot of pre-planning to lock down those ranges for us. So. That makes sense because you're dropping HE and stuff like that, and they have to section off a bunch of stuff. You probably have to book it in the range control, rip oh, yeah. and all that stuff far in advance. Um, well, yeah, you guys are an integral part of the combined arms uh, of combined arms in general, like mm. mortars and indirect fire weapons. Um, I mean, you probably see just as many mortar videos online and stuff like that as you do of people sh- shooting machine guns because it's like everyone always wants to time the the drop in the round to like the beat dropping on a song oh, or something yeah. like that. So people always think that's like super cool. And all my buddies love taking videos and stuff like that of their of like going to the range and dropping rounds and stuff. Um, what, what's what's your favorite part about being a mortarman if you had to pick one? I mean, I don't think this uh, this answer is necessarily strictly mortarman, but I, I just love the leadership, like okay, like part of it, and being able to, you know, teach people and make them the new war fighters of today, because you know, at the end of the day, everyone's time is limited. You got to make sure the generations coming down and are just as lethal as you are. Yeah. No, passing the knowledge, passing the torch, that's huge. Mm-hmm. So you enjoy teaching people. Yeah. Well, that that's also an important piece. Like having people that are passionate about teaching is huge. And and the one cool thing about teaching is that the more you teach people, the better you become at it too mm-hmm. as a result. Yeah, yeah. Because you're going over it, practicing it in your head. You're rehearsing before you teach it. And then while you're teaching, you're like, ah, yes, this is something I almost forgot. Like, I'm now remembering, and it gets deeper ingrained in your brain. Yep, that's yeah. a big part of it. Yeah, just as beneficial to the instructor as it is to the instructee or the instructed or whatever. No. Yeah. So you like being a mortarman and you enjoy it. Oh, yeah. I mean, at first, I feel like no one chooses to be a mortarman. Yeah? They're always voluntold, but... Did you get voluntold? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know a being a mortarman was when I watched like, what's a mortarman yeah I was like what is this yeah uh, you drop bombs uh, I mean I guess that's kind of cool but you know I want to drive in uh Vicks like LAR yeah yeah shoot machine guns yeah yeah stuff like that we still get machine guns you guys get 240 yeah we right? get 240 yeah, yeah uh but yeah so like no one not a lot of people pick that MOS but you know you got to be prideful in what you do always and 100 you know if you Go into it with the right mental attitude, like you'll learn to love it. Yeah, and I think at this point, I wouldn't have cho- I wouldn't have chose to do anything else because I love this MOS. That's and- awesome, man. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's that's the kind of people I want doing that job. I want people who are passionate about it. You know, people that love what they do, people that love teaching other people and like 
mentoring the new generation coming up to learn this stuff like that's that's hugely important yeah we need we need people that have that passion and share that passion with others you know uh we're only as good as the 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 you know we're only as good as the person who is least good at their job around us so we got to build each other up so that's like that's huge I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's like a huge part of of why you like doing this job yep. so Anyway, I appreciate your time. Um, I know you you got stuff to do. It's it's Saturday. You got libo. I appreciate you will, will being willing to take some of your liberty time to come sit down and talk with me. You know this old dude that's like some random rock eater. You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate you taking the time. And hopefully somebody gets some sort of benefit from this, and somebody sees this and maybe gets a little bit more insight on what it means to be a mortarman. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for your time. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Awesome, man. Appreciate it.